again for another edition of Crosstalk. We are continuing to try and use this time to explore, uh, especially what we're doing on Sunday mornings, yeah. and also to sort of share with you the conversation that we have um, about how we understand the church season that we're in and sort of what our goals are. So we find ourselves um, in the, uh, the second whole week of Lent, kind of like the two and a half week mark yeah. of Lent. And uh, we're continuing with our series that's based on covenants. And this has been a hard series for us to get our minds around. I think it can be a very fruitful and productive one, um, but it's one that takes a little bit more time to sit with to understand. It does. So uh, do you want to actually just share a little bit about how we fell into this, how we decided to do covenants? Yeah, you know, we're moving as we were projecting uh, what kind of studies we would do in Lent. And there are a variety of ways that we find um, series and focus. But um, as we approached Lent, we looked at the lectionary. Uh, and that's one of the places I think that I've uh, found helpful and challenging as I've uh, preached and taught through the years. Uh, the lectionary, of course, is assigned readings. It's an ecumenical list of readings. It's not law, but um, if you follow the lectionary, you'll go through all of Scripture in three years, or at least the major parts of Scripture. And so the lectionary um, will take us into passages with which we're familiar, and we uh, can really mine those places and get excited about it. But it also pushes us, I think, to places that we wouldn't necessarily uh, turn to uh, in scripture and we're challenged to again deal with these texts and then understand how they fit in with the larger story of God's purpose for us. So the, the uh, covenant series was really suggested by the Old Testament readings uh, in the lectionary and I think um, one of the reasons the study of covenants is challenging is that it does take us back into the Old Testament uh, in, in a variety of places and so we're not just looking at those with historical interest, but we also have uh, been looking at them as, as you've said, God's revelation of, of God's purposes for us in, in history. And so, you know, how do these covenants inform God's revelation, who God is, what God is about, who we are, what we're to be about? And then how do these also um, sort of inform both our need and our expectations as we look toward uh, Good Friday, as we look toward Easter, because this is all part of the story. So it's, it's, it is difficult, as you say, because it's, a, um, it's an interwoven sort of narrative, and we're looking at a piece that's not often considered as we look toward uh, the, the cross and the resurrection. So it came from lectionary, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think it's also just been a wonderful challenge to go back into these uh, old texts and look at them from a fresh perspective. Absolutely. Um, so the the lectionary is this good discipline um, for us to take scripture seriously and to look at scripture that we don't often look at. Yeah. Uh, and and because of that, to understand it uh, in in deeper ways than we sometimes have in the past. And, um, yeah, this idea that we're trying to use the covenants as a, um, a source of revelation. And we're not the first people that have done this. Um, Paul begins his letter to the church in Rome uh, with this incredible statement. He says that I'm here to share with you the good news about Jesus who is uh, by the Spirit, the Son of God, and by flesh, the Son of David. Mm -hmm. And then he closes out that introduction in saying that you know, in the gospel, uh, God shows his righteousness or his faithfulness. And then Paul spends the whole rest of the letter trying to show how God has been faithful to God's promises. Righteousness, again, is that word that means um, that you're in right standing and good standing and what Paul has in mind is the covenant promises God has made to his people. Yeah. And bit by bit, Paul goes through and says, this is how God has been faithful to this covenant promise. This is how God has remained righteous in his covenant.
covenant relationship with his people. So we're not the first people who have done this. Um, <laughs> this is an old idea. Um, but it's a good one because what it does for Paul is it gives Paul this incredibly deep understanding and this big vision for what God is trying to do for us in Jesus. Uh, and it gives Paul confidence, among other things, um, to be obedient to God in an extraordinary way. Not in Romans, in another letter, Paul has the wonderful statement that um, he knows that what he's entrusted to God is safe because he knows the character of the one that he's entrusted it to. And again, all of this is based on this very big understanding of what God is up to in this world and how Jesus fits into it. Yeah, you know, we've talked about this, that in one sense, as we preach through these Old Testament covenants, um, you've said we're just sort of preaching through the book of Romans. Yes, not that's, in, that's exactly Not exactly in the order that Paul <laughs> does them, but certainly Paul addresses all these issues. And I think one of the things that's impressed me uh, as we go through the covenants and looking with Paul and other New Testament writers back to them is the, um, the immensity of God's purpose, uh, you know, to, the reminder that God's covenant with Noah is a covenant with creation, is a covenant with the world, as well as with human beings. So, you know, we've got this kind of large lens in which to begin to look at salvation, which Paul picks up in Romans 8. But, um, you know, the covenants are also covenants to Israel. And I think as, as Protestant Christians in the 21st century, we have a lot of difficulty in understanding what God's faithfulness to Israel is all about. Some people want to set it aside. Some people just want to simply identify it with national Israel today. But, you know, somehow, you know, God is, is being faithful not only to the Christian church, but his own people. And Paul is struggling with that through the book of Romans. But all of these covenants, as you say, Paul is saying, you know, God has been, the, the bottom line on all of it for Paul is God's been faithful. God's been faithful. And, and he's been faithful in Christ and he'll be faithful to us. Right. And I think a, a little step further, Paul allows the covenants to frame his understanding of what Jesus is all about. And that's a pretty profound way to go about it. So um, we talked about Romans 8, and Paul has this big idea that what God has done in Jesus is for all of creation. That's, we began the series by talking about the covenant that God made with Noah and with all living creatures. Mm -hmm. And we have this strong idea that God's work is for creation. Human beings are a problem. But after the, the covenant that God makes with Noah, God's not going to work against human beings for the good of creation. God is going to work with human beings for the good of creation. So that's a pretty important thing. That's yeah. not just in Romans 8. This is also, by the way, all the time that Paul speaks about uh, Jesus as the new Adam. Mm -hmm. Um, and then last week, we talked about this family that God gets involved with. God's going to work with humans for creation. And he's going to work with a special family of humans through creation. This family of Abraham and Sarah, family of promise, family of blessing. Um, and then we talked about, and Paul talks about this in Romans, that that family got a lot bigger after Jesus because of adoption. We're all children of Abraham. When we exhibit the faith, when we give the yes to God that Abraham did. Mm. So that's God enlarging God's family of promise, enlarging God's family of blessing for creation. And this week we're moving on to the next covenant. So if you keep on reading through the story, the next time that God shows up and starts making promises with people, it's in the book of Exodus. And it's a covenant that God makes with this newly formed group of people. At the beginning of Exodus, we meet them. They're the descendants of Jacob, who is Abraham's grandson, um, also called Israel. So they're the children of Israel. And they are in a foreign land. Um, in the time of Joseph, they went down to Egypt. And they prospered there. But um, a new king has come to the throne and is afraid of their power and their numbers. And so uh, begins to try and control them. Population control and also 
uh, made, makes them forced into labor, uh, makes them a slave population. And so, interestingly, at the uh, beginning of the story, um, God is not that present. Um, the story begins with some disobedient Hebrew midwives. Yeah. The, the king of Egypt is persecuting these Hebrew people, and he sent out an edict that all the little boys have to be killed because we don't need any more guys. And these disobedient Hebrew midwives, it says that they feared God, and so they refused to kill the little boy they were supposed to kill, and instead um, they preserve him, and by grace he finds his way into the royal household, and he's raised in the, uh, in the care of one of the Pharaoh's daughters. And uh, this young child grows up to be Moses, which is an Egyptian name, by the way. Um, and uh, Moses grows up in this incredibly privileged position, but Moses is not happy about what's happening with his people. Um, and Moses has a heart for justice. And Moses tries to do his best to stand up for his people, but it doesn't turn out very well. Mm. Um, and so we get through the first couple chapters of Exodus, and we find this middle-aged, uh, failed activist in the desert uh, taking care of his father-in-law's animals um, and it's at this point that God comes into the story yeah and God has a conversation with Moses and says I've heard the cries of my people and I remember the covenant that I made with Abraham and these are my people and I'm going to take care of them I'm going to bring them to the land that I promised Abraham that I would. And so begins this wonderful story of God and Moses working together to square off against Pharaoh and to lead the people out of Egypt. Yeah. And uh, we have this wonderful um, idea. Um, Abraham has every reason in the world that he cannot do this. And God cuts him off at every, at every excuse and says, no, I'll make sure that you can do this. Yeah. And so Moses ends up in front of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and says, please let God's people go so that they can go to the wilderness and worship God. Mm -hmm. And initially, it's just for a short period of time. We just want a three-day festival where we can go worship our God in the desert. And this sets up this showdown between God and Pharaoh, and it's an amazing story, a great story. Um, but that only gets us through half of the book of Exodus. Yeah. Not even half of the book <laughs> no, of Exodus. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the people uh, are led out by God and by Moses into the desert, and they find their way, God leads them, to his holy mountain, which is somewhere out in the desert. And uh, at the holy mountain, God meets the people, and he offers them a deal. And the deal we read about in chapter 19 of Exodus. And you remember kind of how it goes? Yeah, the, the, they come through the Red Sea, which is an incredible miracle, incredible crossing where God preserves them. And the armies of Egypt are destroyed. They get to the mountain Sinai. Well, and in between that, God gives them water and God gives them food and God gives them manna and quail. And yeah, and God's presence is with them. They're mm -hmm. led out by this... <clears throat> pillar of uh, cloud by day and fire by night they get to the mountain and it's a it's a uh, becomes a frightening scene for the people there's <clears throat> lightning there's thunder there's well god god offers them a deal yeah and god said here's the deal if you obey my commandments then you will be my people and i will be your god and and even though the world belongs to me and everything in it you'll be a special people a holy or a set apart people. And uh, in your special job is that you're going to be a kingdom of priests yeah. on my behalf. So and, you didn't like my part about the thunder and lightning. That's a part of it. Well, we're going to get there. Yeah. Uh, the God says to Moses, give the people my offer. And the people say, okay, we can do that. And God says, we're going to meet on the mountain. And I will give the people the terms for my covenant. And when God shows up on the mountain... Things get scary. That's when they get scary. That's right. Yeah. And so God speaks from the mountain 
And this is what we're going to talk about on Sunday. God speaks the Ten Commandments from the mountain, and all the people hear. And uh, the Ten Commandments, with the exception of one of them, really, begin with a don't or a no. In Hebrew, it's lo. So you can imagine the people huddled together in front of this mountain. They've been let out by this God, but now this God shows up, and it's terrifying. Yeah. There's earthquake, there's a horrible storm on the mountain, there's thunder and lightning. No, don't comes from the mountain. The Ten Commandments are received, and um, how do the people take it? Yeah, they're ter well, they're terrified. Yeah, they say, don't let this guy talk to us anymore. Yeah. We no, promise we'll do whatever he says, just don't let God speak to us anymore. And Moses... He well, and, and God says, don't come near the mountain. He, he gives them the warning that if they come, it'll be death. But thereafter, the people are like, uh, Moses, if anybody's going to do it, you do it. We're, we're not going to do it. They say, don't let God speak to us anymore or we will die. You go talk to him. <laughs> and whatever he says, we'll do it. Right. Um, and then so Moses goes up on the mountain. And for the next three chapters or so, God gives Moses some more regulations, and they have to do with things like Sabbath. Uh, they have to do with the way that we treat one another. Um, and then in chapter 24, Moses comes down off the mountain, and he has all of the stuff written down. And uh, there's a special ceremony. Chapter 24 is a very overlooked part of the book of Exodus, but it's one of the most important parts of the whole story of the Old Testament. Because in chapter 24, the people have received the proposition, and they received the terms for the covenant. And Moses comes before them again and says, do you want to do this? And the people say, yes, we will obey, and we want to be the Lord's people, and we want the Lord to be our God. And they have a solemn ceremony. And in that ceremony, the people bring uh, bulls as um, fellowship offerings to be shared with the Lord. And Moses takes the blood from the offerings and he puts half of it on the altar and he sprinkles the rest of it on the people and he says, this is the blood of the covenant that you're making with God today. And they read the, the law again and they share it. And then when everything's said and done, the mountain that was off limits, God says, Moses, you and your brother and a handful of other representatives, there's the Abihu, and then um, the 70 elders come up to the mountain and we'll share a meal together to, to consecrate um, this covenant that we've made together. And it's this confusing part of scripture where it says that they saw the God of Israel and he didn't destroy them. It's this, you know, goodwill offering time of fellowship uh, to cement this deal that they've made. It's an extraordinary uh, vision that we're given. Hmm. And then in the rest of Exodus, God says to Moses, come on up, I'm going to move in. Uh, it's like a marriage, you know. We, we made this covenant to be together, and now I want to live with you. I'm going to live with you. And the rest of Exodus is really um, God's uh, instructions for how to build his home, his tabernacle. Um, and then you have the golden calf there. But Really, the rest of Exodus is about tabernacle and God coming to live with the people. Yeah. So that's the covenant that we're turning to. It's this covenant that God makes not with Moses. It's the covenant yeah. of Moses, but it's the covenant that God makes with the people. People. Through Moses. Um, and this is a definite uh, step down the road in the revealing of God's purposes for creation. So how do you see this covenant that God makes with the, the newly freed children of Israel in the desert? How do you see that as a moving forward of God's plans? Yeah, well, obviously God is, is concerned with um, the redemption of creation and of, and of humankind, not just with one family, but, but you know, God moves from Abraham and his family. And now he's got this larger group to work with. I mean, so I think that the covenant is expanded and also they're, they're more hands on deck because as you said, they're a, uh, to be a kingdom of, of priests and to God. And so we have these, you know, the, the, the idea of the kingdom of 
going back, it's, it's God recovering um, Adam and Eve and their role of, of uh, care, the wise care of creation, but also this idea of priest unto God. So, so union coming back together. We've talked about this in Sunday school and we've talked about this in our Sunday evening uh, elective. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff uh, kind of with Dallas Willard and he has an interesting definition for what a kingdom is. You remember what Willard's definition is for kingdom? Well, he talked, is it the range of God's effective will? Yeah, our kingdom is how far our word goes. When you ask somebody to do something and they do it, that's your kingdom. And when they say no, you have come to the end of your kingdom. kingdom right. <laughs> so yeah, the, this idea of kingdom, it's hard for me to hear it and not think about medieval Europe. Right. Um, and knights and horses and kings with silly haircuts and goatees. But uh, this idea of a kingdom has to do with the enforcement of your will. How far yeah. does your uh, does your word go? Yeah. God says, in the beginning, it was all my word, but now there's this contested part, and I want it to come back under my control. Will you voluntarily come back under my control? Right. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying about this kingdom and all the caricatures that we have. And I've been in settings where uh, it's been suggested that in the Christian church, we need to move away from that sort of language because we don't have monarchies anymore. But really that does reflect, I think, a, a intellectual failure on our part to grapple with the realities of uh, authority and what authority structures look like. And so when we are talking about kingdom, uh, we're not, first of all, talking about earthly categories. We're talking about categories of authority, how it's exercised, who exercises it. And, and, you know, this is the way that God has set things up. And I love that idea of, you know, the range of God's will or the range of our will. That, that's an important concept when we think about the kingdom of God and our participation in it. And so, yeah, I, we just need to do some hard intellectual work and transcend our own narrow categories in the, this part of the 21st century where we just think everything should be a democracy or chaos. Or an anarchy. An anarchy. So we're, we're really dealing with some really kind of profound thought here. So, yeah, I mean, God's going to uh, reign and rule through his people. Yeah. And, and it is, I think it is important for me at least to go back to this God's going back to Eden to recover everything that was lost and then to, to move forward into the future with it through yeah. his, his human creatures. So I've become convinced, uh, you know, over the past 10 or 15 years that I think the book of Exodus m might be one of the greatest storylines ever. Yeah. It's an extraordinary story, and I encourage you to just go back and read it uh, Pretend like you've never heard it all before. And if you can sit down and read it all in one go, it is a fantastic piece of literature. Well, and just the, the movement of the book of Exodus, um, you know, we, we remember, I think, if, if anybody has any knowledge of Exodus, we think of the, the Exodus experience of the 10 plagues and the movement through the Red Sea, and maybe we take it up to Sinai. But uh, we really are at loss if we don't push through. And as you said earlier, the larger part of the text is about God dwelling with his people. And I think unless we have that scope, I mean, you're reading this kind of story of redemption and salvation moving on into tabernacling and, and a, a dwelling with God, which is really the story of Jesus. And it's the story of his redemption but also the tabernacling of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, the gospel is there in, in Exodus as well as it is in the four gospels, I think, in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, ju just a masterfully laid out piece of literature. Um, and I guess it's easy to write good literature when you have good material to work with. Yeah, and when you have good inspiration. Yeah, I, when we say story, I don't want you to hear that um, I'm implying that I think that it's fiction. Um, but the way that we tell facts does matter. And you can tell them in a way that's boring or not helpful, or you can tell them in a way that's extraordinary and illuminating. Yeah. And the 
writers of Exodus have done it in an extraordinary way. But there's lots of different ways to take the story. It's, um, if nothing else, it's a, a love story. Um, and it's this interesting uh, movement where a people have been rescued by a power that they don't know and they're getting to know each other. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a lover rescuing his beloved and then, then them getting to know each other. That's an extraordinary story. Yeah. And that's a great way to read the book of Exodus. Um, it's also a story that uh, begins our sort of interaction with the command and the law. And so it's good to read it that way. What is God asking people to do? And that's important. And why he's asking them to do it, which you'll unpack a little bit on Sunday right. for us. Um, so what we're going to try and do Sunday is take a more narrow focus and ask this question again. How does this story and how does this deal that God strikes, this covenant that God makes with the people, um, how does it relate to, again, this um, very basic practical idea? God has said, I want to recover what was lost. How is God practically going to do it? Yeah. And uh, the reason that we're doing this is because the ultimate practical way that God does it is Jesus. But again, all of these covenants, and again, Paul is so insistent on this in the book of Romans. All of these covenants narrow us down to Jesus. And all of these covenants help us understand what God is trying to do in Jesus. Um, so let's just do one example and then we can be done. But if we follow out this line of thought uh, through Noah and the covenant with Noah, God says for creation, I'm going to work with humans and not against humans. And then God explains what that looks like through Abraham. I'm going to work through this particular family of human beings in order to bless the nations. Um, and now we've come back to this family, and God says, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they knew me as El Shaddai. They knew me as God Almighty, but they didn't know my name. They didn't know who I am. I'm going to tell you, you're my people. You'll know who I am. Uh, and as a result, you're going to be this kingdom of priests for me. What does a priest do? What's a priest's job? A priest is an intermediary who functions in between two parties. Yeah, yeah. A liaison, a, a, a diplomat. Um, and you stand between the divine and the, the created order, between the creator and the created. Um, and your job is to hear what God has to say, revelation, and share it with creation. And then you're supposed to take the needs and desires, the heart of creation, and present it to, to the divine. And that's what priests do. Yeah. Um, what an extraordinary way to start understanding what it looks like for God to bless all people through this family. What a, an incredible way to begin to understand what the law is for and what the law is all about. And what an incredible way to understand who this Jesus is. You know, we have this idea that we get in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the great high priest because Jesus is able to enter the Holy of Holies. And uh, on top of that, Jesus is not only the great high priest, he's also the great sacrifice. And so um, in his role as priest and in his role as sacrifice, Jesus is able to more completely fulfill these roles. That doesn't even begin to touch this idea of, God, of Jesus as the perfect intermediary holding together heaven and earth, sharing heaven with us, sharing us with heaven. Uh, it's an extraordinary way to understand what God is trying to do for us in Jesus. Yeah. We, we keep shrinking down, I think, the immensity of the gospel. And, and, and you know, sometimes we have to because, you know, we're applying it in particular areas and it is applicable to particular things. But but God's story is so large. The other thing, as you were talking, that really intrigues me about the story is one, um, how God takes God's time to mm -hmm. do this. Um, you know, there are often a lot of years. and 430 used, years. 430 years. So that, you know, is a long time for us humans, but God takes God's time. And then uh, the other thing that intrigues me is 
the immensity of these promises that God gave to Abraham. And Abraham must have been scratching his head a lot of the time going, what in the world is God talking about? How, how is all of this going to happen? It's so large and so big. And the plan is so large. And, and so then that raises the question, how is God going to do this? And I guess the other thing that jumps out at me is, it's usually kind of not the way I would think about it. God's doing things differently, uh, surprisingly so. Um, and then he's working with this human material that sometimes resists. So God has to even do, I think, you know, plan B with human beings to get them back on plan A. You know, they, there's a lot of shifts. So, but it's just great, as you say, it's the greatest story that's ever told. It's, it is an extraordinary story. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Is a, is a historian, I, I don't read much fiction because I prefer history because truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, you know, you, you can't make up a story better than history, even secular history. It's like, what in the world was that person thinking? And uh, what in the world is happening here? And so that's just so amplified when we get into scripture. The truth is stranger than anything that we could ever make up. Yeah, it is. And, um, Again, I, I hope at the end of all of this, we can walk to Easter with just a new sense of wonder mm -hmm. um, at what exactly God has done. So we follow one train of thought about what God is doing in Jesus. But um, if you keep following that train of thought, and again, you end up here in the book of Romans, it begins to help us understand what the gift is for for us. And who have we become now that we've been adopted into this nation um, where we're called to be priests? And what does that look like? And what does the place of the law become in our lives now? Those are all questions that get answered in Jesus. But they're all set up, um, explained. I'm not even say foreshadowed. I'm just say explained. Yeah. Um, when we better. look at the covenants, um, we begin to see what God's purposes are or what they've always been. This is an exciting uh, journey. It's, it's, been ch it's challenging at times, as you said, to um, really grapple with all of this, but I think it's also just really exciting. And it does fulfill, I think, what Paul's intention was in the book of Romans, as we see God being faithful in the past. I know. When you think about the good news, what is the good news? Yes. It's that I can trust. I can trust this person that they will come through on what they've said. That's the good news. It doesn't matter if Easter's true or not, if God's not faithful, if God's going to take it back tomorrow. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it was a one-time deal and God can't do it for you whenever again. The good news is that God has made these covenant promises and God has shown that he is righteous. And he'll do it in a way that you never expected. Yeah. So keep your eyes open and your heart open and uh, be encouraged in these days. Uh, I love the, you know, the, the post-resurrection experience, uh, appearances of Jesus. It, one of his favorite sort of uh, encouragement for the disciples was, don't you dare be afraid. Just do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Lord knows we need those words today. Absolutely. Thank you, Nathaniel. Pray us out. Absolutely. Okay. Father, again, we give you thanks for your word. Um, as the faithful and thoughtful record of your dealings with your people, we confess that uh, history is confusing and we don't always know how to understand things. But thank, thank you for your faithful people through the past uh, who have listened to your voice, who have had discerning hearts, and who have been able uh, to see your hand in history. And thank you for the hope that it gives us. We do give you thanks for Easter uh, because it gives us the confidence with our brother Paul to say that we trust you, you are trustworthy, and there's nothing uh, that if we give it to you, you won't take care of and, and give back to us tenfold in the right time. Uh, so please encourage us and uh, just give us to trust you even more not just for the good things that you want to do for us, but for the hard things you ask us to do. Be with us the rest of this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Good night.